just suggest you tighten up the things just in case. Just in case it falls off. When you put it in position. Ah, yeah. oh, right, okay. So it locks, so it yeah. Um, it seems pretty tight. Um, there doesn't seem to be any movement unless it gets touched. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. If you tighten it, mm. that's fine. It won't tighten anymore, I'm afraid. I'll leave it then. It's just yeah, it should be alright. All right. But it doesn't cut off my head off. Uh, it doesn't. I'm going to. There we go. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, um, oh, we're good. Welcome everybody to the Elsa Sussex Elsa Day discussion for the year of 2014. It's lovely to see so many of you actually turn up this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start off just by saying a little bit for those of you who don't know about who Elsa is and what we do and what Elsa Day is meant to be for and its purpose. So the vision of Elsa is a just world in which there is respect for cultural diversity and human dignity. Elsa is an apolitical student-run society that aims to promote social rights and human rights throughout Europe within each respective uh, country. We're currently in over 31 different countries with in excess of 38,000 members, 14 of which group, 14 groups of which are here in the UK, obviously Sussex being one of them. Elsa Sussex loves uh, to do this via the promotion of, and fostering of legal education, so through discussion, debate, moot court competitions, study visits and the like. Moving on to Elsa Day, Elsa Day was initially started around 20 years ago and it was thought of as a day in which is entirely focused on the promotion of human rights. Rights that are not necessarily considered by the vast populace to actually be affected and those that they might not know or want to hear about. We feel that via promotion and via understanding and discussion we can increase everyone's knowledge of human rights and in turn foster, in, foster tolerance and understanding throughout Europe. The motto for Elsa Day is all different, all together. And I think that is greatly encapsulated by what we are doing here today. We're having a discussion on hate speech with a slight facet of the online dynamic, but we have people of different years, ages and backgrounds all coming together for a common purpose and to promote something that is genuinely <coughs> great and applicable in today's society. And it's lovely to see so many of you want to get involved and really foster a better society within our university. So without further ado, that's all you're going to hear from me for the time being. I'm now going to pass on to our illustrious president, Jake Wright, who's going to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, I will keep the introduction brief. Um, I don't want to infringe too much on time. Um, our guest for today is um, someone with over 40 years of private civilian activism um, experience, uh, combating and challenging uh, xenophobia, transphobia, homophobia, racism and imperialism all throughout the world. Uh, through campaigns such as Outrage, and to the Peter Tatchell Foundation, um, our guest today um, is here to discuss uh, the future regulation on hate speech. Uh, as a strong advocate for um, freedom of expression uh, across the world, uh, he will be, um, be discussing how a marketplace of ideas can be fostered effectively without the need for unnecessary uh, state intervention. Uh, I would like to encourage everyone to think critically about the uh, stance that we propose today and to reserve any questions that they may have um, for uh, the very end after this speech. Uh, and without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce the University of Sussex, uh, Mr. Peter Tatchell. Thank you very much. Um, my starting point is that freedom of speech and freedom of expression 
are two of the most important, precious human rights. They're enshrined in every single international and national human rights convention. We believe that as humanity as a whole, which has collectively agreed these human rights conventions, has agreed that in a free, open and democratic society, the right to say what you think and believe is a fundamental human right. But of course we know that all throughout history, people who have often expressed controversial, outspoken views have been attacked, threatened, marginalised, and sometimes even prosecuted for expressing their point of view. I think of Galileo Galilei for his wisdom and understanding of the universe was persecuted by the Catholic Church. His freedom of speech was denied. He was placed under house arrest. And it took 400 years for the Catholic Church to apologize for the way they had treated him. Likewise, the ideas of Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, and Charles Darwin were often denounced. And there were attempts to censor their point of view. <laughs> it was regarded as illegitimate what they were saying. Yet whether you agree with them or not, their point of view is valid and should be heard and debated within a free and open society. Now what I want to do is look at this issue from the perspective of homophobia in music. Many of you will know that there are a number of prominent reggae, dancehall, rap and ragga stars who have put out tracks that variously condemn homosexuality, denounce homosexuality, even incite violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people. Now I think that this issue, or this particular issue, is a very useful way of looking at freedom of expression and free speech in the modern context. Um, you'll all be aware, I'm sure, of the crude misogyny and homophobia that exists in certain strands of ragga, rap, reggae and dancehall music. It doesn't exist in all strands, but in some strands, misogyny and homophobia are very, very pronounced. And I would argue they diminish those great musical genres. They create bad feelings towards the artists, towards the genre as a whole, towards that section of the music industry. Um, performers like Eminem and Buju Banton have been long time in the firing line for their incendiary, sexist and anti-gay hate lyrics. Uh, ranging from raps using words like faggot and sodomite to overtly glorifying the murder of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Um, now my view is that homophobic hate speech or lyrics in music are obviously wrong, as is any kind of hate speech or hate music. It doesn't matter whether it's in a music studio and on a CD, or whether it's in the street or the workplace. Inciting hatred, promoting violence, is fundamentally wrong. <coughs> If we want to live in a free society where everyone feels able to engage and participate, the threat of violence undermines that freedom. The people who are being victimized and threatened with violence will often feel afraid to speak out. So in Jamaica, for example, because of the violent incendiary anti-gay lyrics put out by some reggae and dancehall artists, most LGBT people in Jamaica are afraid to speak out. They're afraid to engage. They can't participate in free and open debate because they fear that they will be threatened and perhaps even killed. So that kind of language, those kinds of lyrics, actually undermine free speech and open debate. What's interesting is that none of the artists who have put out tracks that advocate the killing of LGBT people, 
has ever been arrested for those anti-gay hate songs. Not arrested in Jamaica, the United States, Britain, or anywhere else. Um, interestingly, if people make racist insults, they will almost certainly get arrested and prosecuted. Never mind making threats to kill black people, but the mere uttering of racist insults, in Britain anyway, will get someone prosecuted. Yet, when these singers actually advocate killing LGBT people, they're not even taken to court. So my view is, that is double standards. It's treating homophobia and racism differently. I think there should be a uniform policy across the board for hate speech and for incitements to violence. One form of hate speech or incitement to violence should not be prioritized or dealt with differently than another. They should all be challenged and all be prosecuted if and when appropriate. Now, as much as I deplore any form of hate speech, I think hate speech is wrong. It's, it's not good for the affected communities. It's not good for social cohesion. As much as I deplore it, it's not as bad as actual discrimination, harassment, threats or violence. So I make a distinction between hate speech and hate, harassment, discrimination, and violence. Right now, in Britain, and in most countries in the world, discrimination may or may not be prosecutable. In most Western countries, it is. In many other countries, it's not. But in virtually all countries, <coughs> harassment, threats, and violence are criminal offences. In almost every country in the world, if you incite violence against another person, if you encourage murder or attacks upon another person, if you threaten them, intimidate them, or arrest them, in many, many countries in the world today, that is a criminal offence. And I think that is right. I think that it is right to treat harassment, and threats and incitement to violence as a crime. Because if we don't, we leave those people living in a state of fear, anxiety and threat. So that applies whether the threats or incitements are against a person because of their faith, you know, Jewish, Muslim, Christian or whatever, whether it's because of their race, you know, Afro-Caribbean, African, Asian or whatever, whether it's against women, or whether it's against LGBT people. Um, I would like to see a discouragement of homophobic and transphobic music. I would like to see a discouragement of misogynistic, sexist music and lyrics. I'd like to see a discouragement of music that treats black and ethnic minority people in a disrespectful way. However, I don't think it should be against the law unless it incites violence or unless it is expressed in a particularly inflammatory, sensationalist, aggressive and sustained manner. In which case, it would amount to criminal threats and harassment, which are rightly against the law. If a person is subjected to prolonged extreme hatred for any reason, it is harmful and should be illegal. It is harassment. It's outlawed under the 1997 Harassment Act here in Britain. But also it's true that this kind of ongoing hate should also be challenged verbally, and by protest. It's all very well using the law, but we need to also challenge the ideas. And ultimately, the law is a last resort. 
and possibly the least effective resort. If we want to create a world where there isn't racism, misogyny, homophobia or transphobia, the best way we do that is by challenging those ideas, by showing why they're flawed and wrong, by showing why the evidence or arguments that are being used by those people are fundamentally inadequate and wrong. That's the way to challenge. Um, we have anti-harassment laws in this country. There is no need for new and special laws governing um, hate speech, harassment. You know, we don't need separate laws to deal with hate speech that amounts to harassment. Those laws already exist. However, the reality is that we do have different laws. We do have separate, special, unique laws. So together with anti-Muslim, uh, anti-black, anti-Semitic hate speech, the incitement of homophobic hatred is now a crime. In my view, that's a bad move. Not because I think promoting hate is a good thing, of course I don't, but because, in most instances, prosecuting hate speech is a step too far. Um, it's not, in my view, a sufficient threshold to activate prosecution. I don't think merely saying hateful things is a sufficient justification to criminalize someone. Um, one of the main reasons I say this is because one of the problems with hate speech laws is defining what constitutes hate. Different people have different views. Some people may think that a criticism is hate. Others may say the criticism is fine. You know, I don't agree with you, but that criticism is legitimate. So in the inflammatory debate now around immigration and asylum, there are quite clearly a number of views against immigration and asylum, which are not hate speech, which are not racist. I may disagree with them, but I would not put those labels on them. There are, of course, some views expressed in the debate around immigration and asylum which are racist and do need to be challenged and perhaps in extreme circumstances do need to be prosecuted. But what I'm trying to say is that hate speech itself is really problematic because how do you define hate? Unlike incitement to violence which is usually pretty clear if you say go out and kill a Muslim, go out and kill a Jew, that's pretty clear. But what constitutes hate is much more subjective. It's much more down to an individual's interpretation. Um, the line between hate speech and unpalatable viewpoints is hard to draw with certainty, clarity, and consistency. It's not always obvious. Um, this also, also is true when it comes to homophobic music tracks. When does a bigoted rap spill over into a criminal threat? It's really hard to decide. And I would prefer, as a passionate supporter of free speech, to err on the side of caution. To take the view that unless it really is a clear sustained harassment or a clear incitement to violence, we should not prosecute. That should be reserved for the more extreme instances and examples. We should protest, we should challenge, we should present the counter arguments, but not resort to the criminal law. Um, merely hateful music, although objective, although objectionable, um, although meriting protest, shouldn't, in my view, be unlawful. After all, who decides what is hateful? You know, if we go down the road of criminal prosecution, we put this in the hands of judges. And some judges will rule in a you know, liberal progressive way, some will be more reactionary and conservative. Um, 
Again, the issue is, how would the law define hate? In the laws that exist, it's not properly defined. It's too open to subjective interpretation. So, for me, when I look at some of the incitements I've heard over the years, I ask myself, at what point, at what critical juncture, does a lyric or a speech critical of homosexuality become hate speech? What constitutes crossing the line? And I haven't found anyone, even the supporters of hate speech laws, who can give a clear, definitive answer. Um, how critical does a critical view on homosexuality have to be to constitute hate speech? I don't believe it's a good idea to give the state that power. It's open to abuse, as we've seen in many instances. For example, um, anti-war protesters, anti-war protesters who insulted British soldiers for their role in Iraq. Yeah. Another example, uh, a young man who <coughs> criticized Scientology as a dangerous cult. To embrace the idea that these are sufficient grounds for arrest or prosecution, I think <coughs> is encroaching upon free speech. I'm sure many of you will recall the instances of Christian street preachers who've been <coughs> victims of overzealous prosecutions. What was their crime? They said that homosexuality is immoral and that gay people will go to hell. <coughs> now, of course, I oppose that point of view. I think they're wrong. I shouldn't really be saying that. But I also oppose their prosecution. Now, I was prepared to go to court to defend Christian street preachers who expressed these points of view because they did not express it in an aggressive or inflammatory manner. Uh, they weren't saying that gay people should be tortured or shot or hanged. <laughs> they were simply saying <coughs> some rather inflammatory, but I think most, mostly calmly expressed views that they believe homosexuality is wrong. Um, certainly what they were saying was hurtful. For any LGBT person to witness those statements, those comments, was hurtful and offensive. But I wouldn't say it was hateful. It was a critical view, <coughs> based on a religious belief, um, but it was not expressed in a way that I think justified prosecution. They didn't, for example, these street, Christian street preachers <coughs> did not express their views in the bullying, menacing tone of some reggae and rap artists. So, on those grounds, I've opposed their prosecution. I also defended a Christian housing charity worker who faced suspension and dismissal or demotion after he posted on Facebook his opposition to religious same-sex marriages. Uh, I disagree with him. I think, you know, religious organizations want to conduct same-sex marriages. They should have a right to do so. <coughs> but I don't think that by saying that, he crossed any red line. I don't think he was inciting hatred. As I said at the outset, free speech is one of the hallmarks of a democratic society. <coughs> it should only be restricted in very extreme, compelling circumstances. Criminalizing views that are intolerant and objectionable is, in my view, a slippery slope towards censorship and the closing down of open debate. It's also counterproductive. It risks making martyrs of people 
with bigoted opinions and deflects from the real solution to hateful ideas and speech, which is information and debate. Um, homophobic hate music should be debunked and protested, not criminalised. If we look at the way in which hate speech ideas have been misinterpreted, we can see that there are many examples where peaceful protests against hate speech have themselves been prosecuted as hate speech. Um, in 1994, <coughs> I was arrested for saying that the homophobia and sexism of the Islamist extremist group His Book to Hear was akin to the bigotry of the Nazis. You know, they were saying views about women, Jews, gay people, and others that were very similar, not exactly the same, but very similar to the kind of hateful propaganda put out by the Nazis. Uh, separately, as I mentioned, a, a youth in 2008 was arrested for call calling Scientology a dangerous cult. In both instances, it was deemed that our protests were insulting and had caused offence. In both instances, we were deemed to have crossed the line into hateful speech. Now, I don't believe the right to be spared offence is a human right. Many people say, that's offensive, ban it. I disagree. Just because something is offensive, that is not a sufficient grounds to ban it, censor it, or criminalise it. Lots of things that people say are deemed offensive by others. I'm offended by the misogyny of some clerics. But I don't think they should be prosecuted for holding a view that I find reprehensible. I'd say that putting up with a degree of offence is the price we pay for living in a free society. If we're not prepared to put up with some degree of offence, if we want to close down everything that we find offensive, we will end up not in a free society, but a society where freedom of expression and freedom of speech is restricted and put within boundaries. Now, of course, as I said, if someone incites violence or indulges in sustained harassment, I agree that is beyond the bounds of legitimate free speech. Likewise, if someone falsely claims that another person is a tax fraudster or a child sex abuser, that is also wrong. To make false allegations is wrong, and the people who say that should be treated uh, by the law and punished. Because free speech does not include the right to say things that damage another person's reputation and which uh, potentially puts them in danger of physical harm. Uh, we've known many examples of real or suspected paedophiles who've been beaten up and in some instances murdered based on false allegations. False allegations. People believed this person was a child sex abuser it was put out by people on the internet, and they went around to their house and attacked them and killed them. Like a man from Iran only a few months ago was murdered by a mob, which had falsely claimed that he was a paedophile. That clearly should be against the law, and the people who say those things should be very severely prosecuted. Um, in 2004, Together with the LGBT rights group Outrage, the Black Gay Men's Advisor Group, and JFLAG, the Jamaican LGBT rights movement, um, I was involved in launching the Stop Murder Music campaign. Uh, we sought to cancel the concerts of eight leading Jamaican reggae dancehall singers whose lyrics and public pronouncements incited the murder of LGBT people. 
Not mere hate, actual murder. Um, they justified and encouraged and glorified the shooting, burning, hanging and drowning <coughs> of gay men and in some instances <coughs> lesbians as well. Now according to JFLAG, which is based in Jamaica, the release of these tracks coincided with a spike in homophobic violence. In the days and weeks and months after the you know, widespread airplay of these tracks and performance of concerts, there was a corresponding significant rise in homophobic and transphobic violence. Um, that would suggest very strongly a correlation. Not necessarily a direct cause and effect, but a correlation <laughs> between these lyrics and actual physical violence. Um, so we opposed these artists and sought to cancel their concerts, not because they were merely homophobic, but because they said LGBT people should be killed, and because when they released these tracks, J Flag reported that there was a corresponding rise in homophobic and transphobic violence. So it was our attempt to try and pressure these artists to stop their homophobia, to stop their homophobic incitements to violence, in order to protect LGBT people in Jamaica, to reduce the scale of violence against them. What's curious is that all attempts to have the singers prosecuted for incitement to murder have been battered away by the police, both in Jamaica and here in the UK. The BBC, the BBC used to play these tracks until Outrage organised a big campaign to get them to stop it. <coughs> they never ever would have dared play a track inciting the murder of black or Jewish people. But for years, they felt able and confident and with impunity played these tracks encouraging the killing of LGBT people. Um, I've got to ask myself, why is it that incitements to racist violence are treated more seriously than incitements to anti-LGBT violence? Why are there these inconsistent standards, these double standards. Um, going back to my point earlier, how do we best combat homophobic music lyrics? I think that hate speech uh, laws and prohibitions address a problem after it's happened. So if you have a law against hate speech, you invoke it when someone has committed hate speech. It's after the event. It's already happened. It's much better to help undermine and prevent homophobic ideas. Not using the law, but by using reasoned, rational argument and debate. By education. Suppressing hate speech by use of the criminal law is at best a short-term fix. It's not a real long-term solution. Far better is education against hateful ideas. All hateful ideas. Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, misogyny, and anti-LGBT prejudice as well. So what I propose is that to help challenge all forms of prejudice, um, I'd like to see lessons in equality and diversity in every school from the first year of primary level. A compulsory subject in every school to challenge all forms of prejudice. Um, I don't think there should be any opt-outs for independent schools or free schools or academies or faith schools. Every school by law in this country should be required to have uh, mandatory uh, lessons in equality and diversity. Uh, parents should have no right to withdraw their children. You know, the idea that parents should be able to take their children out of classes that are seeking to promote equality and diversity is unjustified. Um, no reasonable parent 
should want their child to grow up bigoted. You know, children, of course, are not born bigoted, they become bigoted by the influence of adults and their peers, and sometimes what they read in the tabloid press. So if we can educate young people from an early age, we will increase the likelihood that those young people will grow up to not be prejudiced, to have an understanding of others who are different from them, to be welcoming and inclusive in the way they treat other people. Um, I would say that these equality and diversity lessons will only work if they are made a compulsory subject and an examination subject. If they're just, you know, something on the side, they won't be taken seriously. If they're an examination subject, they will be taken seriously. And I'd like to see the results of those uh, exams put on every pupil's school report each year. And I'd like to see it made requirement for the production of those exam results when applying for further education and when applying for a job. That's the way to get those lessons taken seriously. Um, and I think that where these kinds of ideas have been trialled in some schools and some countries, there has been a notable reduction in all forms of prejudice. And that is good for every pupil. It's bad for any pupil to be in an environment where they feel threatened, devalued, disrespected, or even in some cases subjected to hateful threats. Um, it's also good for society. It's good for society that we have an inclusive, cohesive community of people who accept difference, who work together and live together in harmony and equality. Um, it's very bad for employers if they tolerate bigotry because bigotry undermines the workplace. You know, if a woman is constantly being sexually harassed, if a black or Muslim person is being subjected to hateful ideas and remarks, to racist jokes, that undermines their morale. It creates a bad spirit in the workplace. So it's bad for the workplace. It's bad, has a not on bad effect for all employees, uh, as well as the operation of the institution. So these equality and diversity <coughs> lessons are my attempt to suggest a way forward. Uh, without relying on the law, using education as the key way to challenge hateful ideas. As I said, <coughs> people aren't born homophobic, they become homophobic. Education can prevent hate, and prevention is better than punishment. Thank you. So we're going to open up now to questions, answers, and contributions. So if you disagree with anything I've said, feel free to uh, challenge me and we'll have a debate and discussion. Um, I, I did like your idea about uh, the uh, sort of equality in school lessons, as it were. But do you not feel that that's only really tackling um, external manifestations of equality? Because at the end of the day, like children will leave school um, and then they will be subjected to the outside world as it were and it's never too late to develop like you know sort of ideas about bigotry or never too late to you know adopt those for yourself yeah there's, there's no guarantee that equality and diversity lessons will ensure that every pupil grows up to be open accepting and you know a supporter <laughs> of equality that's not guaranteed but it does increase the likelihood. As I said, in the examples of schools uh, where this has been trialled, a very significant reduction in all kinds of different forms of prejudice has followed. But so what about I, underground prejudice? You know, sort of, it can be a bit more subtle. Well, I guess, you know, yeah. challenging subtle prejudice would be part of the equality and diversity lessons. Um, you know, as I say, they're not a panacea but I think they would move in the right direction. Um, mine relates to something, it's more of a, a two-parter. With regard to this being an examinable subject and it being something that is then required for higher education, 
my first question would be, do you feel that's the right way to go about it by sort of forcing equality through shaming of inequality? Do you think that should be an institutionalised practice or whether that should be a social construct that students should feel more um, worse to associate with someone who is bigoted and therefore indoctrinate a change of behaviour rather than the school saying you are bad at this therefore you're not going to succeed in the future and the second would be how would you respond to an argument that by examining the subject you're to a certain extent trivialising it by saying that the schools will then teach to pass the exam rather than teach the equality for example we have it in schools where there is coursework, there is seen questions, and the students still don't take the lesson seriously, they just do it because, again, they feel they have to. Is that really going to be effective in people who just, quite frankly, don't want to understand and don't want to develop? Well, I think you're right. Um, these lessons in equality <laughs> and diversity are a guarantee of nothing. Um, but I think they would help create a consciousness and awareness that would diminish much existing prejudice. Um, you're right, some pupils may go through the motions and just you know, give the right answers in order to pass the exam. Um, and that may or may not affect how they personally behave and treat other people. Um, in some instances, they may in their own interpersonal relations not take on board the lessons at all. And ultimately, there's nothing that can be done about that apart from them being challenged by their peers and teachers and other adults uh, around them. Um, all I'm saying is these equality and diversity lessons are an attempt which would move things further in the right direction. It wouldn't be the whole answer, but I think it's part of the answer. Firstly, where are these lessons being held? Like, which countries do this? And also, um, how would you teach it every year? I mean, I can understand you teach people some things, but how would you make it last year for 30 years of education? Um, you know, would it be one year you're kind of doing the basics, and then the next year you're kind of looking at indirect explanation? Or um, how would it work? Well, the trials have taken place in some schools in this country, mostly independent schools, interestingly. Um, and some schools in the United States and Canada. And, um, you know, I don't know of any country that has it across the board, but that is the way things are going. Um, and I think that the provisional results are very encouraging. Uh, when I've been to schools uh, where these kinds of lessons have been trialled, not on the year-on-year -year basis, but just, you know, a small segment for one year, even so they report very positive feedback. Um, I think that in terms of the long-term effect, um, you know, they haven't been done long enough to be absolutely certain. But the provisional, you know, feedback is that this is sustained over time, and that most pupils do genuinely take on um, the information, the ideas given. Um, in terms of you know how to sustain it over, you know. 13 or so years of education. Well, you could ask the same about mathematics or English or <laughs> chemistry or whatever. Um, you know, there are so many different dimensions and depths you can go into. So you could have you know, you know, a specific section looking at the whole history of slavery um, and, and the, you know, the experiences and eyewitness testimonies of slaves and former slaves as a way of getting an insight into racism and colonialism and the, the adverse effects of that. So I'm certain that the, the curriculum could be, could be well filled out and to cover the whole range of issues, not just the ones I've mentioned, but also disability, age discrimination, um, uh, you know, the rights of ex-prisoners, um, uh, Roma and travelling communities. There are lots and lots of different dimensions. Hi, you spoke about um, a positive correlation between being educated and a reduction in people's views, negative views in regards to homosexuality. I'm saying if you completely like disregard criminalizing hate speech and following through with legislation which criminalizes hate speech, surely then you're sidelining the effectiveness of restorative justice 
some element of rehabilitation, which also includes the victim in the equation as well. Because through educating someone, you're just educating them on their own. But the fact remains, like you said with the statistics, people will still be subjected to hate crime, uh, homosexual, Islamophobic, whatever type of hate crime you're talking about. So if you involve the victim in the process, and this is the, pro this is the underlying, I think, theme behind hate crime in general, I think if you involve the victim inside this equation, then that's surely going to contribute to much better results, a more cohesive society, whereby, you know, the points of view of the victim as well as the offender are taken into account and you can really educate them in a much more productive manner. So I think if you're sidelining hate crime legislation generally, like in the manner that you've described, surely then that's a progressive step as opposed to a progressive step towards ed educating society. Well, I think the ideas around restor restorative justice are good ones, mm -hmm. and they do have some very positive results in many instances. Um, but you could achieve that without criminalization. So, for example, there may be a way, um, you know, where without going down the road of arrest and prosecution, um, someone who is um, caught promoting hate um, is required to undergo a, a, a meeting with the victims and for them to, um, you know, discuss the consequences and impact of what they've said. That might be a way of doing it, but I think it could be outside of the criminal justice system. Well, probably you need to be somehow related to it, but it wouldn't, the point is to get away from the idea of criminalization. So um, maybe there would be, you know, like, like within the criminal justice system, we already have a caution as an option in, instead of a prosecution. Uh, maybe there could be something introduced specifically for, you know, hate speech, um, which would involve, you know, as you've suggested, the perpetrator and the victim getting together um, to discuss the impact and consequences. And also, I've got a follow-up question. Um, and by saying this, I mean no offence to you, but yeah. as a white middle-class man, mm. it's very, I think, hypocritical for you to suggest that you don't understand why there are provisions in place for like black and other ethnic minorities, or even members of a certain religious group. Because the fact remains that your race, even your religious dress and everything, that's an outwardly manifested image. Whereas if you're homosexual, to be honest, like, I don't even know you personally whether or not you're gay, but judging by your dress sense and taking it, you're not, they're generally very well dressed. Anyway, <laughs> but, yeah, so um, I'm basically saying that, you know, for, to criminalize and to actually sideline all this kind of stuff for members of minority groups, I think that's needed because we are subjected to gross generalizations. So whenever you talked about there's issues of pedophilia, whenever there's issues of even terror attacks or whatever, it's Muslims, especially outwardly manifested Muslims or members of the Asian community, which are victimized as a result. Lee Rigby, for example, you could say the BBC's reporting of it was not Islamophobic or hate speech or any of that kind of stuff, but the fact remains that there was, I think, a 300% increase in crimes committed against Muslim communities that very same night. You talk about other media, uh, well, you didn't talk about it, but I'm saying if you talk about media reports, when, I think during the 1970s, there was an influx of Asians from East Africa, from Uganda, Kenya in particular, the Sun reported that there, were, and there was an influx of about 3,000 Asians. The very same night again, there was graffiti, shops broken down, which were owned by Asians. You had graffiti saying, Paki Patel, 3,000 more, get out, all this kind of stuff. So I'm saying with us, it's easy to identify and we really do need hate like legislation to counter these kind of attacks and this victimization towards our groups. But with homosexuals, <laughs> Despite, uh, they also need it, in my opinion, but I'm saying that for you to say that you don't understand why there are provisions for us when there aren't for others, I think that's very hypocritical, and I'm not too sure how you respond to that. Now, I wasn't saying I don't understand why, I was just yeah. saying there were double standards. Mm. You know, as I said, you I know, I, 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 a racist attack. Sorry, uh, I was saying there were double standards in the sense that racist comments or abuse is nowadays mostly prosecuted, yeah. whereas homophobic abuse and insults is usually not. So I'm just saying there's a, du there's a double standard there. Um, in terms of you know, what you were describing, well of course if there are attacks upon mosques or Asian businesses, those are criminal offence. You know, to to you know, smash a window or dog graffiti, that is a criminal offence. So those people can be prosecuted. Um, but when it's just a matter of expressing an opinion, I think it's, it's, it's very dangerous unless as, you know, they, they, they are clear threats or sustained harassment or incitement to violence. <coughs> I think it's potentially quite dangerous to criminalise that. Yeah. 
um, I think that certainly those views need to be challenged. And I and many others were, uh, in, have been involved for many years in, first of all, challenging the, the National Front and then the BNP and the EDL over their threats and abuse. But for the most part, we were not seeking prosecution. We marched against them to block their way, to challenge them, to argue against them, to debunk their ideas. And I think that that is ultimately the most fruitful way of overcoming these kind of ideas. It's, it's, it's by protest and challenge. Yeah. And it's very interesting that in the 1970s, um, the National Front, which was a precursor to the BNP, was on the rise. It was getting huge public support. But the mass protest organized by the Anti-Nazi League, which physically blocked the National Front from marching into ethnic minority communities, and the big, big public education campaign by the Anti-Nazi League basically stopped the rise of the National Front, uh, far more effectively than any legislative prosecutions. Um, anyway. Um, Um, I think the same restriction should apply to social media as to any other media. You know, if you falsely accuse someone of being a paedophile and thereby defame their reputation and put their life at risk, a violent attack, you should be prosecuted. Whether you do that on a Facebook post, a tweet, or in a newspaper, or in the street. Um, there needs to be zero tolerance of that kind of abuse of free speech. When it comes to all the other issues, you know, I think some of the people who've been prosecuted uh, probably shouldn't have been. You know, what they said was wrong and stupid and you know, offensive, but to me it didn't cross that line of uh, sustained threats, harassment, or incitements to violence. Um, just going back to what you proposed as an alternative, the sort of additional education, um, I'm a little sceptical, sort of judging from my own personal experience, I did P PSHE, um, sort of citizenship, subjects like that, where this was already sort of included in the curriculum, and also when you talked about slavery, that was also included in sort of history classes. Is it not perhaps better to, to sort of build on what's already there than doing it as an additional subject, whereas people like me who've studied 13 GCSEs already have a huge caseload? Well, I think it varies from school to school. The lessons you talk about sounds like your school did them very well. Many other schools do them very well, but many don't. And I think unless you have an institutional framework of a specific subject, you know, you know, when we have a subject like mathematics or English literature or geography, it has very clear guidelines, parameters, remit. I think with um, you know, the, the current lessons that you describe, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more vague and amorphous, and it's down to the individual schools. Some who do great work and others who don't. So that's why I think a specific subject is justified. Um, my uh, question uh, partially builds upon um, the question posed by uh, my friend Omar, um, who was, I think, two, three questions ago. Um, it's just relating to uh, the legislation around hate speech in general, um, in that um, there is no right to uh, not be offended. Um, but surely you could appreciate um, a, a cumulative effect that hate speech could have, uh, not only to offend someone, but also potentially to psychologically harm them, devalue them as a human being, and potentially dehumanize them as well. And at that point, I think it comes into uh, contradiction with the right to life, a right, right to live, um, a satisfactory and pleasant life in which you are able to self-fulfill. Um, I mean, if let's take for example a transgender w woman of colour, let's say, um, there is like this triple um, potential to be um, subjected to um, a whole gamut of hatred, and I'm sure you can appreciate that that can accumulate. Uh, well, what would be your response to that? In particular? Well, so my criterion were you know, sustained <laughs> threats or harassment. Mm -hmm which is what you seem to have described there, or incitements of violence. But so often nowadays, the law is invoked for a one-off comment. And I think that's, um, I think that's a mistake. You probably 
remember the case of the man in East London who was prosecuted for putting up the stickers, gay free zone. Yeah. You know, I think he was obviously motivated by homophobia. It was wrong, but I think it was equally wrong to prosecute him. You know, saying gay free zone was offensive, but it wasn't inciting violence. You know, it wasn't encouraging anybody to hate or um, um, attack gay people. It was expressing a point of view, a wrong, misguided view, in my view, but not a view that I think crossed that threshold into what should be prosecuted. How do you ensure that the views of the teacher aren't passed on to those taking the class? Because it, I'm sure if there's differences between, say, a Catholic school or a Church of England school, you know, based on the same idea, but but different. Yeah. So how, how do you ensure that the person teaching you isn't necessarily passing their views on to you without necessarily realising it, say? Mm. Well, I think, you know, the equality and diversity lessons should exist within the framework of a national curriculum, <coughs> which has guidelines about how the subject is to be taught. And already, lots of subjects have those guidelines and those uh, parameters so that teachers have the guidance to know how to teach the subject. So I would say that, that that's the way to do it. There's um, uh, a website called, I think it's called The Classroom, which is specifically set up to deal with LGBT issues in school, where they have a, a, a series of um, guidance notes for teachers about teaching LGBT issues. Basically, lessons online, which teachers can then download. And I think the same should be basically applicable to all subjects. There should be a core national curriculum that is required and compulsory in every school, whether it be a state school, uh, a faith school, independent or academy or free school. Every school should follow the core national curriculum and there should be clear guidance. Obviously, within the, the, the framework, there should be some degree of leverage and uh, leeway for individual teachers and individual schools, but the basic principles should be there and that should be reflected in the examinations. So I think that's the way you would get around that issue. I just wanted to ask you about the first part of your speech. You know, you were mentioning that there is a freedom of expression. It's one of the most important rights we have. And you were also, like, at the same time, you said that there is a lot of this homophobia speech in uh, rap songs and reggae. And I actually, I don't know, like, I never thought about it because I thought like rap songs genuinely brings like some anger, just like a type of music. I don't know, like you, you might listen, you might not listen to it because it genuinely have a little like swear and stuff like that. But and uh, you then you said like uh, that we should basically pro probably like, prosecute, but there is no this line where there is a hate speech in the song or like you no know, like line defining that you can prosecute the person, but 